uploaded to the internet. Okay, so today we're going to talk about this quest for certainty. Uh, so ever since the Enlightenment era, the, the goal of the Enlightenment was to return to the old Greco-Roman culture and to rid ourselves of religious dogma. Basically, the idea is we're trying to get outside of religious presuppositions and go to objective knowledge that can be found from anywhere instead of relying on the revealed truth like the Bible. So the idea with the Enlightenment is, let's find this universal law for, of everything. We're going to find one key that's going to unlock all of our knowledge for us, and we don't need to depend on religious doctrine to get it. There are four key figures here that I'll be talking about related to the Enlightenment. The first is René Descartes, the philosopher, who is one of the founding members of the Rationalist School in Modern Philosophy. The second is Bertrand Russell, the famous mathematician. The third is Alan Turing, who is the father of modern computation. And the fourth is King Solomon, who embarked on a very similar project uh, when he was younger and uh, came to a greater understanding later. He pretty much foresaw what would happen of the Enlightenment and its disastrous consequences. More on that later. Okay, so our first figure here is René Descartes. He was a rationalist, and he invented the Cartesian coordinate system. This coordinate system is used for uniting geometry and algebra together. Uh, he was an enemy of the skeptics. Uh, he believed that we could know things, and he did not like the skeptics for denying these things. So instead of uh, just battling the skeptics, he says, okay, I want to give knowledge an absolute foundation. This is also called hard foundationalism. It's a view of epistemology, uh, the theory of knowledge, that doesn't really exist much today, but it was a little more popular in his day. And so his discourse on methods showed us how is it we can bust skepticism and build our knowledge on a foundation of absolute certainty. All right, now the skeptics had this trilemma. And he said, okay, if I know something, let's say I know this is my right hand, uh, what happens if you just keep repeatedly asking, uh, how, do, how do you know that? Like, I know it because I see it. Well, how do you know that? Well, I don't know, I have certain sense perceptions. How do you know that? It's like a little kid who asks, why, 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 incessantly. And eventually you're like, just go to bed, it's, it's late, it's past your bedtime. Right? So there, there's sort of three things that could potentially happen. One is you could start going in a circle. You keep explaining things and you start explaining things in a circle. Uh, secondly, it could be regressive, where you get this infinite regress that never terminates. And the third is called axioms. You eventually reach these sort of bedrock of axioms. Since all systems of logic and mathematics that we've built are axiomatic, the other two uh, lead to difficulties. There's really no way to build a logical or mathematical system off of a circular or regressive area. You have to build it off of axioms. And so this is what René Descartes set out to do. He said, okay, I'm going to build some certain axioms and build my knowledge completely on that. So, okay, here's, here's Descartes' method. He said, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to doubt everything. I am going to doubt that I exist. I'm going to doubt uh, that my physical body is here. I don't know, maybe I'm in the matrix. Uh, I'm going to doubt my reason. I'm going to doubt God. I'm going to doubt everything. He says, okay, I've, I've doubted everything. What can't I doubt? Well, I can't doubt that I'm doubting, right? That would be contradictory. So I can't doubt that. But wait, I said I am doubting. But if I'm doubting, therefore I exist. So I think, therefore I am. And this wasn't really original. All of these moves, all of Descartes' best moves, were from Augustine. These were Augustine's arguments, which... Descartes is now employing. So the question is now the outside world. Again, how do I know I'm not in the matrix? Or that I'm a brain in a vat? And how do I know that my reasoning that I've been doing is reliable? Well, not sure. So, okay, what about this? I have this idea of a perfect being in my head. Um, if I was a perfect being, I wouldn't be having this doubt. I'd have certainty about everything. So, I can't be this perfect being. But I have this idea of perfection. So what about that? Well, this idea 
in my head of perfection must have had some sort of cause, right? Couldn't have come out of nowhere. So where did it come from? Well, I don't think it came from sense experience. I don't perceive perfection, at least in its ultimate sense. Everything around me seems to be just some imperfect representation. And, okay, so not that. Uh, could I have fabricated it? Well, when I fabricate things in my mind, let's say a unicorn, I'm thinking of like a horse and a horn, and I'm putting two pre-existing ideas together. I'm combining ideas that are already there. But you can't do that from imperfect ideas, so that's not going to work. Okay. Can't fabricate it either, so therefore it must be innate. I, I have to sort of be hardwired with it. So how do I get hardwired with this idea? Well, only a perfect being can do that, can hardwire me like that. So therefore, there must be this perfect being, God. And so God being this perfect being wouldn't deceive me. He'd program me with innate knowledge, but also with reliable sense experience and a world that I could at least perceive fairly accurately. I have to have some sort of reason as well. And so now I realize with God here, there's no way I'm going to be tormented by, let's say, a demon or like the Matrix or something like that. But the things that are causing my sense experience really is accurate, and so is my reasoning. Therefore, I can trust my reasoning and my sense experience is reliable. So cool, I have a system of knowledge. And I called in God as a guarantor of my sense perception. But yeah, I don't need to base my beliefs on, on religion. I, I have simply reason, and that alone will get me to knowledge. But the problem is, there's a huge flaw in his reasoning. If he, if he went through sort of the meditation, Rene Descartes sought to build knowledge on these undeniable axioms. He wanted to go axiomatic, because it's the only system where you can build like knowledge. But he didn't. He ended up going in a circle. Because... He always assumed this entire time that his reasoning was accurate, even though he never proved it. It, it wasn't undeniable at the beginning, and his whole reasoning process presupposed accurate reasoning. And so this is why his view of hard foundationalism really never took off. We sort of realize that in philosophy, you can't start with this absolute undeniable certainties. I mean, there are some things you have to sort of put in, maybe take it on faith. Even people who go to things like coherentism will say, well, the coherentist principle itself sort of has to, you know, it kind of has to be your starting point, and then everything else, and then that's our model, and we'll, we'll build things from there. But this idea of building our system of knowledge on undeniable bedrock through rationality just isn't going to work. And so, yeah, human reasoning is not capable of simply proving its own reliability. You have to take at least that on faith. And so that failed. Okay, so then Bertrand Russell came along later on. He's a famous guy, did a lot of research in logic and mathematics. He busted the original set theory, which we thought was so certain. Set theory was sort of what we thought of as the foundations of mathematics. What are these numbers? Why they're sets, and a set is like a collection of things. Like, you can have a set of, like, all the dominoes on the table, let's say. But he found a paradox in it. Uh, even though before he found this paradox, set theory seemed so self-evident. And so now the mathematicians are running scared. They're like, what if, what if our arithmetic uh, has a similar uh, in, incoherence, like, deep down? And so he said, okay, this is seriously problematic. Let me build arithmetic as an extension of predicate logic, first-order first predicate logic. Because these logics, like, for example, propositional logic, can prove its own consistency and its own completeness. We know that works. We know there isn't any contradiction there. So if we start out with, like, logic, and we extend mathematics as part of it, we have this good bedrock. And so that was the project of him and his mentor, Alfred North Whitehead, in the Principia Mathematica. 
and he also was seeking out a consistency proof for arithmetic to prove the consistency of arithmetic. And so uh, Gottlob Frege helped to advance logic from uh, what, what was called syllogistic logic, the logic of Aristotle, to what's called sentential logic. This is the logic that's used in computer programming. So it took Russell and Alfred North Whitehead 10 years, or over 10 years, to build Principia Mathematica in three volumes. It was mind-numbing work, uh, going through line after line, like line 72.142, like there exists some set such that the set has such and such a property. All right, you know, line, you know, the next line, and it's just dozens and dozens or, or yeah, dozens of lines per page, hundreds of pages. Uh, and if there's one flaw in the logic, uh, your whole thing goes apart. So they had to just mentally just check line after line after line to make sure that their thing was working. And their ultimate goal was to describe this one set of axioms and inference rules in symbolic logic from which we can deduce all mathematical truths in principle. So we can derive this entire system. We have the perfect foundation, and now all we have to do is grind at the intellectual mill, and we can discover any problem, uh, discover any truth about mathematics. Any question we can state mathematically, or at least with number theory, we will be able to solve. And there's two things he absolutely needs here. Consistency and completeness. So... Consistency basically states that you can't prove a proposition and its negation. There's no statement where you can, like, let's say, prove 1 plus 1 equals 2 and then prove 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. Any system that can prove contradictories is simply not consistent. And the second is completeness, which says for any question you can ask, of the system, or any statements you can give within the system, you can either prove it or prove its negation. So that's completeness. <laughs> now, Principia had plenty of problems just off the bat. It's difficult to understand. Even mathematical logicians had a difficult time understanding it, because it's got just so many thousands and thousands of, of lines of this sort of manual code. It took 379 pages just to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Uh, they added axioms that were not matters of logic, which means that as soon as you add additional axioms beyond logic, now you don't have this guarantee that your, your system is consistent or complete. So people are wondering with these new axioms, um, <laughs> which he needed in order to, to prove mathematical truths. Do we know if the system is consistent or complete? And so, uh, Kurt Gödel completely spoiled the party. It's kind of funny that in these like Hall of Fames of mathematicians, there's like in some of these colleges busts of famous people like um, Leonard Euler, for example. But many of them don't have Kurt Gödel because he just sort of spoiled the fun. He was a great mathematician, but it's like people kind of want to distance themselves from him because he showed that no system like uh, Russell's system uh, or Russell's goal could ever be achieved. So he just, he busted them, destroyed the hope, and basically what he showed is that you can represent statements about mathematics or about piano arithmetic within piano arithmetic uh, with a process called encoding. So you can encode logical truths and state them as mathematical statements. And that way you can ask questions about mathematics and answer them from within mathematics. Uh, so there's these problems in logic, these kind of glitches called liar paradoxes. So if I say this statement is false, is the statement true or false? Well, the statement is false. Okay, that's true, which means it's false. Okay, so, so it's a false statement. Well, now it's true again. So this statement uh, is strange. Or if I say the following statement is true, the previous statement is false, okay. Um, I don't have self-reference, at least, you know, with this statement is false, I had self-reference. So, Russell and Whitehead said, all right, we know this paradox, we're not going to allow you to do any self-reference within our system. We'll protect it against that. Okay, what about, like, the following statement is true, the previous statement is false? Well, no self-reference, but there's still a paradox. So, okay, we need to prevent us from being able to, like, address 
like other you know have a statement address other statements or else we have these things okay fine let's let's create a safeguard okay now if I say the person teaching defenders is lying okay there's no direct self-reference right I mean I'm indirectly referring to myself but not directly um, but uh, and I'm not referring to other statements and yet at the same time I have the same paradox if it's if you know that statement is true it's false if it's false it's true <coughs> And so Gödel found a way to encode a similar paradox uh, within Russell's uh, Principia Mathematica system. So uh, if you go to Gödel Escherbach uh, by Doug Hofstadter, uh, it, it's an okay book. Uh, it's very ideologically loaded. Uh, so I think Gödel's Proof, uh, there's a book called Gödel's Proof, uh, which is shorter and easier to understand. I recommend that instead. Basically, he had the statement U and G. And basically, statement U is, that, is to say uh, that you, uh, you cannot have a proof pair or have one, state, uh, one statement that, prove, that has a, a proof within your system uh, or, and, and pair it up with uh, like a, one statement being plugged into itself. So it's like you can't prove that you can plug every statement into itself. That's what U basically is. And G plugs U into itself, pretty much. And so what that means in plain English is something like the formula whose Gödel number, remember this is, this is encoding now, we're encoding logic into mathematics. The formula whose Gödel number is such and such is not provable which is just a fancy and indirect way of saying, okay, G or this formula is not provable. So the question is, is this formula G provable or not? Well, if it's provable, then it's a false statement. Your system proved a false statement, and so it's not consistent. Now, we realize, okay, fine, so it can't be proven, right? If the system's consistent, you can't prove the statement. Well, that means that you have true statements within the system that you are not able to prove, and so the system is incomplete. And so the question becomes, okay, can we repair Principia so that these paradoxes don't arise? And Gödel proved in the same year that there's no way you can do that, because there's three things you need in a system if you can ever hope to achieve Russell's goal. The system has to be rich enough to express all statements about numbers, the system has to be able to generalize the statements into formulas and represent them. Basically, what that means is if, I, if I'm able to prove in the system, uh, let's say, uh, 1 is odd, 2 is even, 3 is odd, 4 is even, 5 is odd, 6 is even, and, and so on and so forth. I then have to, to prove uh, a general statement that every whole number is either odd or even. Because if I can prove all the particulars but I can't generalize it, the system is something we call omega incomplete. So what that means is you, you don't have all the generalizations you need. And, and so you've got, to general, you've got to have these generalized formulas to discover all truths about mathematics. And, and thirdly, uh, you need some procedure for deciding whether the proof within the system is valid or not. Uh, so this is also called decidability. So your system's got to be uh, consistent, complete, and decidable. The problem is, if your system is rich enough to express all arithmetic knowledge, it's vulnerable to Gödel's paradox. And so there is no set of axioms and inference rules, or one set of, of axioms and inference rules, which can give you all of these truths. Now, someone in, in Defender's class mentioned, well, what if you had, let's say, an infinite number of axioms? I'm like, okay, theoretically, I mean, you could build a system of infinite axioms that gives you all mathematical truths and is consistent, complete, and decidable, but that, that would be basically by taking every mathematical truth and making it a separate axiom. That's really the only way of doing it. And if you have that, then you don't need to crunch mathematical formulas because you already have the truth. You just look up the mathematically true statements within your axioms. And unless you're God, uh, you can't do that. So basically, here's what I've stated, and the conclusion is from like Morris Klein, God exists since mathematics is consistent, and the devil exists because we can't prove it. So just like the problem of Descartes and certainty, 
we can't have certainty about reality. And we can't even have this island of certainty within mathematics, the one thing we thought we could be completely certain about. And mathematics now can't even, piano arithmetic, for example, can't prove its own consistency. And so that's, I mean, that's even further problematic. Great, what's this, you know, tower of knowledge doing? So mathematics alone can't prove its own reliability. In a sense, you do have to take it on faith. And so, okay, Alan Turing came along. He's this great code breaker. He's the father of modern computers. Uh, if it wasn't for his work, you wouldn't be able to even watch this presentation on your own computers. So he created this thing called a Turing test for artificial intelligence, where you ask in a, like a, in a chat session a bunch of questions, and if you can't tell if the answers are from a human or a computer, it's considered passing the Turing test. He also worked on what's called the halting problem, uh, in, which is what we're going to talk about in, in computer science. So the halting problem is like, okay, Turing's like, <coughs> okay, we can't prove the consistency of all of mathematics, but okay, can we at least have some procedure to decide whether or not, like when my computer's running a program, it's going to stop, whether or not this problem is eventually going to give me a result, or is it just going to get stuck in some death loop? Like if your program is trying to calculate all the digits of pi, it's never going to end. It's just going to get stuck. But how do we know if it's if it's stuck, like calculating the digits of pi, or if it's eventually going to stop, it's just taking a long time? Well, computers are logic-based math machines. So is there some algorithm or one program, one key to deciding this for any possible program? Well, Alan Turing, of course, proved that there's there's absolutely no way that's possible because he, he encoded something similar to the liar paradox into the programming language. So basically, here we go. This is, this is our halting detector program. We're calling it Q. So, all, so if you've got this Q program, right? you're going to analyze whether this program, given a certain input, is eventually going to return you something, or is it going to run forever? That let, Let's say you have this perfect program. So, fine, what happens if you get some sort of like a liar program, a stinking liar program that gives you the wrong output? You know, if it halts, it's going to say loop forever, and if it loops, it's going to halt. And then, as the inputs, you use the liar program as well. Well, you'll never be able to then give an accurate answer for that. And so this program Q doesn't exist. It, it contains self-contradictory properties. There is no one algorithm for deciding whether or not all programs will halt. So not only is there no one system that can solve all logical and mathematical truths, there's no system for deciding it. So I mean, we're even worse. Okay, we don't even have an island within the island of certainty. So finally, King Solomon actually came along much earlier, and he predicted much of this failure during the Enlightenment. He, he's the famous king, the most powerful of Israel's kings. He built the first temple. He was super rich. People even from Egypt were paying him tribute. Uh, he had complete power. Uh, he was also extremely wise. He wrote many of the Proverbs. And in the Proverbs, that was part of sort of his research of Finding the key, what method can I use to guarantee success? And you find sort of versions of, of, of this in, in the like the self-help literature. Think and Grow Rich is, is the similar system. Uh, do this, this, and this, and success will come to you. And, and he was looking for what set of procedures, what one set of procedures can I have, what one key can I have to getting total success. But his conclusion is the book of Ecclesiastes, which he also wrote uh, a, as the result. And so here we go, we, near the beginning he says, I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know the wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also but a striving after the wind. The words of the wise are like goads and nails firmly fixed on the collected sayings. They are, but, they are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. He, he realized that, that uh, it is futile to try to get this, this perfect system. So what was his conclusion? His conclusion is the end of, of the matter. 
All has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, with every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says there is no key uh, on this side of eternity. Ultimately, you've got to go to the key maker. There, there's no one procedure on your own to get this success. And so when we look at the Enlightenment, uh, one of the projects was to sort of divorce ourselves from religion, from scriptural truth, and try to build everything on human reason alone. So Descartes, Russell Turing, and others, uh, and there's many others. Uh, I think Marx tried to build everything on economics. Uh, Richard Dawkins is trying to build everything as like evolution is the one key to everything. And th these are all the same kind of failures. They're trying to have the key, and it inevitably collapses. They think they're, they're building themselves this sort of tower to, to perfect knowledge and enlightenment, but all they're really doing is building these intellectual towers of Babel that inevitably come crashing down on their creators. And as, as Paul not, noted in Romans, he says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And so the real problem is not any of these things, intellectualism or science, uh, the whole intellectual revolution, the enlightenment, no, not the enlightenment, uh, much of the industrial revolution and the advance in science is not from atheism, but from Christianity. The, uh, like Newton, people were very uh, devout Christians. Uh, because Christianity's doctrines uh, state that unlike the pagans, like the pagans believe that, say, the river is a god, a personal being, and the sky and the sun are gods, they're personal beings, and they have to be appeased. Whereas with Christianity, there's one creator for this, and the natural order is dumb. It's just mindless, meaningless, non-free, non-rational, brute physical particles. This is what the religion of Abraham uh, and monotheism in general has taught, and so it's the one system to say, uh, that nature is dumb and therefore it seems to be intelligible uh, through mechanical processes. And Christianity specifically has reason to believe that because God designed this physical world, it could be discovered that like the math that runs it is intelligible. It's, it's, it's amazing that like the equations of quantum mechanics can fit on a page. Uh, it could have been the case that the equation to accurately describe it or general relativity, for example, could have taken a million pages to write down. But general relativity, for example, has been discovered to be accurate to within at least 13 places of the decimal. And you don't get that on, on randomness. There's something more behind this. And, and so when we have this, this sort of Christian worldview as our, our cornerstone, we can have true knowledge. But when, the, the problem is, when we try to build knowledge on this foundation of like man's autonomy, we are going to run into to destructive problems. It's like building your house on, on the rock of scripture versus on the sands, the shifting sands of human autonomous reason. Like where are your intellectual foundations? If you build it on God's un, unchanging word, then you have something to go off of. You have an intellectual path. If you build it on the, these shifting stands of, of like pure rationalism, uh, you're going nowhere. Your intellectual tower is just going to collapse. So, so where are your intellectual foundations? And, and so in conclusion, the Enlightenment sought to, to find the key to perfect knowledge. But Descartes showed that there's no key uh, to certainty. No, there's no perfect system to knowing everything. Gödel showed that there's no key to discover all logical and mathematical truths. It's, it's impossible in principle. Turing showed there's no way of even, no universal thing for computability to decide uh, whether something can, uh, whether some computer program is going to halt. And Solomon foresaw the entire thing. He said, no, there's no universal key to success uh, of any of these. Uh, you've, you've got to go directly to the key maker. And I added as a bonus to this presentation uh, a eulogy by one of these transhumanists. There's this guy, Eliezer Yuchowski, who's the head of the Singularity Institute. He believes that we're going to, like, like he believes that religion is just dumb fairy tales and, like, the idea of, like, Christians wanting a rapture, that's just, that's just stupid wishful thinking. 
So instead, he believes that eventually technology within you know, a few decades is going to advance super rapidly once computers can program themselves. And that way, we can upload our consciousness into computer systems and live for billions or trillions of years. So it's basically kind of like a rapturism for atheist tech nerds. And, and, and yet they, they mock uh, theists for believing more or less the same thing. Well, this guy's younger brother Yehuda died a few years ago. And so this, this is sort of Eliezer and the atheists' eulogy for his brother. Uh, basically, and I, I've abbreviated it. Uh, you can get the full thing online. He said, I used to say I have four living grandparents, and I intend to have four living grandparents when the last star in the Milky Way burns out. I still have four living grandparents, but I don't think I'll be saying that anymore. Even if we make it to and through the singularity, remember that's, that's sort of the tech rapture, it will be too late. One of the people I love won't be there. The universe has a surprising ability to stab you through the heart from somewhere you weren't looking. Of all the people I had to protect, I never thought Yehuda might be one of them. Maybe it helps to believe in an immortal soul. I know that I would feel a lot better if Yehuda had gone away on a trip somewhere, even if he was never coming back. But Yehuda did not pass on. Yehuda is not resting in peace. Yehuda is not coming back. Yehuda doesn't exist anymore. Yehuda was absolutely annihilated at the age of 19. Yes, that makes me angry. I cannot put into words how angry. It would rage, it would be rage to rend the gates of heaven and burn down God on its throne, if any God existed. But there is no God. So my anger burns to tear apart the way things are, remake the pattern of the world that permits this. I wonder at the strength of non-transhumanist atheists to accept so terrible a darkness without any hope of changing it. But then most atheists also succumb to comforting lies and make excuses for death even less defensible than the outright lies of religion. They flinch away, refuse to confront the horror of 150,000 sentient beings annihilated every day. 1.8 lives per second. 55 million per year. Convert the units. Time to life. Life to time. I wonder if there ever was an atheist who accepted the full horror, making no excuses, offering no consolations, who did not also hope for some future dawn. What must it be like to live in this world, seeing it just the way it is, and think it will never change, never get any better? I watched Yehuda's coffin lowered into the ground and cried, and I sat through the eulogy and heard rabbis tell comforting lies. If I had spoken Yehuda's eulogy, I would not have comforted the mourners in their loss. I would have told the mourners Yehuda had been absolutely annihilated, that there was nothing left of him. I would have told them they were right to be angry, that they had been robbed, that something precious and irreplaceable was taken from them for no reason at all, taken from them and shattered, and they are never getting it back. Goodbye, Yehuda. There isn't much point in saying it, since there's no one to hear. Goodbye, Yehuda. You don't exist anymore. Nothing left of you after your death, and like there was nothing before your birth. You died, and your family, Mom, Dad, Hannah, and I, sat down at the Sabbath table, just like our family, had always been composed of only four people. Like there had never been a Yehuda. Goodbye, Yehuda Yudkowsky. Never to return. Never to be forgotten.